be able to tell Charo some, some good news. Um, we've been waiting on a, a federal grant we were awarded um, from the CDC to look at these issues of health disparities in minority communities in the Ypsilanti area. And um, federal grants sometimes, even when you're awarded, take a little while to come through. And so we've been in a waiting game for six months. So we learned yesterday that it's a go. So we're actually going to be able to help fund some of the implementation um, that, that Charo will be doing that's coming out of that, uh, coming, cut it, coming out of that grant. So hi. So I'm going to wrap things up and really talk at a little bit more of a philosophical level to a degree with a couple examples. I'm Amanda Edmonds and I'm the executive director from, of Growing Hope and I, I know many of you in the audience here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our approach and our approach in the, as an organization over the last ten and a half years and, and what that means with equity. But first sort of, um, do you guys know the word social disparities of health? Ever heard of that term? It's a very public healthy term. Um, the social disparities of health and the social uh, determinants of health, both of those terms, um, about where we live, what our race is, what our class is, uh, what our geography is, and, and how those play, a, play many, many roles in, in health. Um, our county epidemiologist at the County uh, Public Health Department, Adrian Waller, is really amazing and does a presentation that gives you, I think, some of the most shocking data of where and how inequities exist. Um, she analyzed all of the units of government, 28 uni units of government in Washtenaw County, and their average age of death. That's mor morbidity, I think, is that? Mortal morbidity. Um, and you look at that on a map, and you look at those numbers, and it tells you that there are some very real disparities, because um, you can look at obesity, and you can look at chronic disease, and all these things we so often talk about. But when you get right down to it and see that someone in Chelsea Village, the average age of death is 85, and the Ypsilanti Township is 66, we see an almost 20-year spread. And that's due to all sorts of factors related to health, obesity, chronic disease, violence, education level, race, class, location, et cetera. So even our relatively affluent county, that disparity is very, very wide, and we have to think about in everything that we do how we can help level the playing field. So I like to start anything I say um, in talking about privilege and recognizing that the work I do um, and the, the ability to get where I am um, comes first from the fact that I was born white and middle class in the United States of America, and those are things that I had no control over, but those afforded me automatically the opportunity to go to a university like the University of Michigan to have opportunities because of my race to not be um, not be held back in so many ways that people have no control over but still are very real in our society so I, I, I try to start by just recognizing um, recognizing that and recognizing the inequities um, that no one signed up for in our communities and that if I can do one thing in my life it's use that privilege that I was given for um, for for no reason of something I did myself um, to help to um, help to level the playing fields in whatever way we can and think about those shocking numbers of 20 dear year life expectancy in just two parts of our relatively relatively affluent county here in Washtenaw. Um, Growing Hope's mission is to help people improve their lives and communities through gardening and increasing access to healthy food. And our core philosophy is and always has been, we're about 10 years old, we're based in, rooted in, dedicated to um, the community of Ipsy City and Township and surrounding areas. And we work throughout the county and somewhat throughout the region of the state. And anyone can come our way to the great community of Ypsilanti. Um, but we are based on the idea of people having a chance to participate in that positive and healthy change that they believe in their lives. And not everyone has that privilege and those opportunities, and so we try to do in everything, um, everything that Growing Hope does, increase those opportunities for people to have a chance to participate. I'm gonna tell you just a couple of our core values um, that, that really drive that, and then I'll talk about a couple programs, including one of the ones funded by this HUD Sustainable Communities uh, grant that we've been lucky to be uh, a partner on, and we're lucky for Jennifer Hall when she worked for the county, who was the main author of, of that grant. Of that Grant. So one of those um, one of those uh, one of those things is best illustrated in a story from my very early days back in about 2000 and, uh, 2004 2005. I was a young I was a young thing then, uh, and with all my energy around my community in, in Ypsilanti, um, helping people uh, start gardens and had started a, a garden. Um, uh, community youth school garden back in the day and was meeting people all over the community and, and met some folks at a, a great community called Chittister Place, which is a, a publicly subsidized high rise in the uh, the south part of Ypsilanti. Um, there's about 120, is that right? About 120 single, um, single occupancy of apartments, um, publicly subsidized, managed by a private, um, private 
you know, real estate management company. Um, and the average income at that time of Chittister residents was $7,000 a year. And so you understand and can imagine all of the barriers and challenges and inequities that residents there face. About a th the profile of the building at the time, about a third, you know, about a third of those residents um, were seniors, about a third were mental health consumers, about a third people with physical disabilities, a lot of people overlapping in multiple categories. And Jennifer, if you remember some of these statistics, if they've gotten mixed off in my head over the years, please, please correct me. Um, and the, the, there is a lot of really great work going on by a number of um, a number of health and service providers in that building because in a building where people fit that that profile and have so many barriers and challenges, you can imagine there's many social service agencies, public health agencies, visiting nurses, therapists psychologists, people bringing food, et cetera, kind of passing in the night, coming and giving that service to people um, often actually very isolated in those, in those apartments. And I think that that is a kind of place that exemplifies a population of people very rarely asked to participate and asked what they can do and asked what they do know. And I say that my experience at Chittister was one of my greatest early teachers about that um, and about the power of giving people a chance to participate. So some of those folks in the, um, who were sort of passing in the night in the building um, combined with some folks in the, um, in some residents in the, in the building um, who were forming a residence council also at the time to think about looking at things from a different perspective, looking at things from an asset-based approach, thinking about what could neighbors do for each other. Here's a building of 120 people, many of whom didn't work, most of whom didn't work, have a lot of time on their hands and a whole lot of life experience and therefore, of course, skills and knowledge. But that's not how our system often treats them. So the management of that building gives me a call at some point, I heard I'm the energetic person around doing gardens and says, well, we got this money left over from HUD, we got to spend it at a certain time, for landscaping, can you come build a garden? Our residents want a garden. And I said, well, no, of course not. Yeah, I, I live in, in the community, but I don't live in this building, so I'm not going to do something for people. But I can come facilitate. I can come and bring my energetic self and a flip chart and some vegetables. Um, and so we flyered, uh, flyered around the apartments, and, and about 40 people showed up. So just by asking and saying, hey, you want a chance to participate? Because it's come down to the lobby. About a third of the building came and had that chance. And I said, I hear there's interest in a garden, and so tell me about it. Um, and so I was facilitating and saying, well, you know, people are saying, well, I, uh, I uh, for 40 years, we, my husband and I had a 40-acre farm. Well, that trumped my 20-something-year-old gardening experience at the time. Someone says, I can can and pickle anything. And someone says, yeah, I work construction. And someone says, and someone says, and someone says. And all of the resources were in the room. And that management called me because I was an expert. I was the outsider. I was the, the person who would know something, who therefore had some power and control or something, although I didn't know a lot. I was really a volunteer around the community at that time. And I turned it back to say, well, you have a, a building full of residents who, who, who know and have everything, and I can play that role of facilitator. And that garden that was built that year at, at Chittister Place entirely um, by residents and some other youth in the community and people we helped organize has been run by those residents who are so very seldom asked what they can do. It's been run there as a community garden since about 2005. That's actually one of the oldest community gardens in the Ypsilanti because we gave people that chance to participate. Now, it doesn't mean the garden isn't a microcosm of, uh, of you know, feuds and disputes and little power struggles and animal control and fights with the management and all those things that anything we do as communities together are full of. But that garden has really, has really sustained. Um, there was a, ch a time when the garden actually had to get moved to a different part of the site and, um, and I found myself again questioning my core belief that everyone comes with strengths and skills and assets and it's about coming as a partner, not a service provider, but as a partner and saying, well, we bring some skills and facilitation and we know where to get compost cheap and maybe we got a truck we can help come dump and you got this and we all come together. Um, that I found myself questioning a resident in the building who is a, a regular around, around town who is, um, a, has no legs and is in a wheelchair. And when we were rebuilding some, some beds, and, and my, in my head was like, oh, well, he wouldn't be the one to do the main post hole digging, et cetera. And let me tell you that I found myself relearning and always relearning what people are capable and able to do. 
Um, so I'm already in my, in my one minute. But I think that story really, uh, really I illustrates um, that basis of what we did at Chittister Place and that story of gardens is what really led into what we've been doing now since about 2006, which is our garden leadership training. So we help communities, neighborhood groups, schools, faith-based organizations, churches, synagogues, et cetera, um, anyone who wants to do a garden or a community greening project or things like that, by not coming out and building for them, but by teaching basically community organizing and project planning and leadership development. Because while I got a lot of skills and I could probably go do that, I really can't when I don't live in that neighborhood, when, I don't, um, when I'm not going to be part of it in a sustained way. So we bring groups through, and we actually, our institute is coming up. Um, so if you know anyone in the region, we've had groups come from Milford and Belleville and Adrian and, of course, uh, Ann Arbor and, of course, Ypsilanti come and have a very, 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 very low-cost sliding scale um, intensive training for teams, because we think community projects really need to be done by multiples, not by individuals, um, to uh, come and learn from us. I'll say one last um, thing in, in closing, I think another really important point about thinking about equity and community change and community voice and community involvement, and one important thing for Growing Hope, is that we work, live and we work in the same place. Um, I live in, my neighborhood is where the first habitat um, the first habitat, uh, when they switch from doing new builds to rehabbing, they rehab five houses in my on my on my block. Um, I rarely hire people who don't live in or aren't willing to move to Ypsilanti, where the core of our work is, because there is nothing like being in, hanging out, being neighbors with um, the the people that you quote serve and or partner with. We we make strong institutions um, by being one and with and part of something, not by being an outsider or an expert. Um, from elsewhere. And for us, that's what really equity and justice sort of starts from. So thank you.